MBNF introduces the MBNF Lab, a hybrid retail experience that showcases MBNF timepieces alongside kinetic art pieces. Did you know that Singapore has garnered the largest community of MBNF collectors in the world? Brand founder Max Buser chose to open the first MBNF Lab in Singapore to recognize the undying support of these collectors and the energy that the hourglass has put into educating collectors about about high-end independent watchmaking. This new 53 square meter boutique on the first level of Raffles Arcade follows the recently revamped architectural identity of mad galleries. The clean, crisp interior in white provides the perfect canvas for MBNF's curious offerings. Moments before the opening of the world's first MBNF lab, Revolution and the Rick founder Waco caught up with his old friend Maximilian Buser. Well, you can feel the ground vibrating with energy. You can feel Singapore tantalized with excitement because a man who is a true legend is here in our country. Max Buser, how are you, sir? <laughs> Good. My gosh, don't introduce me that way, please. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's great. It's been three years. Three years I haven't set foot here. I used to come here once, even often twice a year. The largest community of MBNF lovers and owners are in Singapore. So luckily there's social media, there's Instagram, there's all that. We've been able to stay a little bit in contact. But um, we build this brand on personal relationships on, and, and being true. And not about, just, we, we've never had money for advertising. It's always about... Let's let's engage, let's inspire. And so for me, it's, it's cool. I'm really happy to be back here. You know, Max, I think of you as being an innovator and also a guy that, you know, likes to obliterate traditional boundaries, right? So, uh, you know, obviously you, I think you've obliterated the boundary between you know, a watch and a piece of art. Talk to me about obliterating the line between a normal retail space and a gallery. Everybody talks about a customer experience. Today, for me, the labs are basically um, a place where you come and hang out. It's a place you've got a quarter of an hour, half an hour free. You love watchmaking, you love kinetic art, mechanical art. You come and have a coffee here and we talk about it. You don't have to be an MBNF owner. You don't even have to aspire to be an MBNF owner. <laughs> you just have to love this sort of world. And that's what I wanted to offer. And we started that. 11 years ago with the Mad Gallery in Geneva. And then we had one in Dubai. And now we're creating this lab concept. But the lab is in a smaller space because galleries need really big spaces. And, um, and so the point is, you, you love watchmaking, you love kinetic art, you love mechanical art, you want to hang out, please come to see us. So again, treat people the way you want to be treated. That's what we've done here. Uh, you've got are timepieces. The hourglass is incredible in the fact that they've kept, even though they could sell them a hundred times each. <laughs> so you can try them on and you can see the other art pieces, you can see the pieces we've designed, other artists that we like to introduce. You've got uh, Quentin Carnaille, yeah, you've got uh, the, the breakfast team, you've got Frank Buchwald. So all these artists that we love are for the first time here in Singapore. And we'll tell you their story because their story is as important as what they do. I think I get inspired, so most people would get inspired. I love that. So you're continuing the tradition of championing the small guys. Look, I love sharing what amazes me. If you look even on my Instagram account, um, I, am, I use it as anything which I find amazing, which is by far not only watches, I want to share. When we started MBNF, we had a blog on our website called A Parallel World. And every week for, I think, 12 years, we had a subject where we wrote about something which interested us, which was not about watchmaking. That was an enormous work. And uh, I did it for two reasons. A, because I love to share something which amazes me. And B, when you're a, a creator, a self-finance entrepreneur who's got daily issues to survive, which has been the case for many years at MBNF, you get tunnel vision. And so for me, talking about things that I love from other people is, oh, it's, 
makes me feel good. Nice. And it makes me, it gets me out of my MBNF world. Don't get me wrong, I love my MBNF world, but I need that other part of it. I need, and I'm, I'm so much more enthusiastic when I talk about the artists in our gallery than I am about my own pieces. But that's my personal humility, which kicks in where I feel very self-conscious when I, I talk about my pieces. Amazing. Um, you know, Max, a couple of questions I want to ask you about yourself first. So you are in a very unique position because to me, you are both the guy who was the greatest champion of independent watchmaking and really put it on center stage through the Opus project, which you created and then subsequently became one of the most famous independent watchmakers as well. How do you feel about having these kind of two roles? And is it interesting to have you know, existed in both of these perspectives? They both happened by chance, and they happened because of an interior voice, which was definitely not a business-driven voice. So Opus, as you know, I, I started to help a friend, an obscure watchmaker called François Paul Journe, well, 20 heard, years yeah, ago, exactly. who just was launching his brand right. and, and nobody knew about him and it was like oh let's let us tell the world how brilliant you are and handshake and it happened and it, it was it was incredible it was the beginning of something incredible but when we started neither of us neither François Paul or myself had any idea where this was going and, uh, and it was a great win-win like most collabs great collabs are great win-wins and um, and then what happened is that Opus allowed me to meet these independent, fiercely independent creators whose life centered around their brand, not because it was a business, but it's because it was what made them proud, because it's what they loved doing. And there was no money in this. And most of us barely survived for decades. So it was about, this is the only thing which makes me happy. And I'd been working for brands, and I saw these guys who actually were working for themselves and just being happy, whatever the cost to it. And one day I realized, I want to be them. I want to be them. And that's the beginning of the idea of MBNF. Uh, uh, originally, I thought, I'm not a watchmaker. I'm an engineer by training, but I'm not a watchmaker, so I can't create a brand. And then I realized, well, I'm a guy with weird ideas and who, who has a knack for bringing great people around the table and who enjoy working on projects with me. Hence, MB and F, and I started. And I was just telling somebody this afternoon, when I started MB and F, I had the design of HM1, a drawing of HM2, which finally was not at all the HM2 which came out, and that's all. And I went all in, put in my savings, saying I'm gonna create a brand, and this is my first watch, the HM1, and let's do this. Would I do this 17 years later with a family? <laughs> like, probably never. But it was, let's do this. And um, you look back, 17 years later, 20 calibers later, wow. horological machines, legacy machines, co-creations, MBNF labs, mad galleries, um, mad editions. And you're like, wow, this is incredible. So imagine what we were able to do in 17 years Imagine what we could do in the next 17 years. That's going to be really interesting. That's incredibly exciting. You know, Max, I mean, you're one of the you know, immense success stories of our industry. I think like for every one of these watches that we have on this table, I estimate there's between 100 to 1,000 people that want that one watch. Yeah. And so it's a little bit tough today to even find allocation. But I remember you telling me a story of one of the toughest moments that you experienced. And I found that to be so compelling because I think from the outside, people always look at, at you know, what you've achieved and think it's easy. You know, can you just tell us a little bit about this, you know, this really challenging moment you had in terms of the HM1 and the oh. company that was meant to deliver these watches for you? Right. Look, we, we nearly went bankrupt four times in our 17 years. So 2007, 2009, 2012, and 2014. Wow. Luckily, all for different reasons. So we're not too bad as entrepreneurs. <laughs> so 2007, is the, the pl airplane is taking off, and actually the, the company which um, engineered our movement and was going to produce the components and basically assemble it, because I was all alone in my flat, um, got sold overnight in the middle of the process. And uh, the new owner had clearly different goals. So that was really scary. And uh, I'll always remember a meeting we had in 8th of January 2007, 
where uh, the new owner basically said, look, we don't have the possibility anymore to assemble your movements. I was like, I can't assemble my own movements. And he's like, I'm sorry, we can't either. And, um, and that day, Peter Speak was with me, luckily. I mean, karma is incredible. And um, he said, look, we'll take care of it. And while we were driving down to, to Roll, where I dropped him off, he started calling up his friends, independent watchmakers, saying, look, my friend Max is in trouble. Like, who's Max? That's not the point. But we need watchmakers. The guy's like, no, 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 no. I... And, um, and he said, no, but you owe me. So Peter, I mean, inc- when I call, say the brand is unfriends, the people who've helped us have been incredible. And so he's going to call his favorites. And, um, and I'm going to end up 10 days later with five watchmakers in front of me. One I knew well, it was Laurent Best, and four others I didn't know had been called by Peter. And they had a mission. We had five kits with 360 components, but 50 were missing, but we didn't have the plans and we didn't know which ones were missing. And guys, try and assemble this movement. So assembling a movement like that should take two weeks. After four months, we still hadn't managed to open, to finish a movement. I was completely out cash-wise. I mean, Everything of my money had gone. All the money had gone from our retailers who believed in me and paid me in advance was gone. And I think by mid-June, we would have been bankrupt. And more or less a week before, we managed to deliver the first two pieces. So um, those are episodes which uh, build you. Actually, tough times build you much more than success. And uh, I'm today glad we had all those tough moments because they showed me how resilient we, can, we are and that we find solutions and that when the going gets tough, the tough get going and that there are people out there who are there to help us. Never those we expect often, but they're there. And, um, and as I said, one of the uh, fringe benefits, one of those five watchmakers who I'd never met, his name is Stephen McDonald, and Stephen was the genius who was then single-handedly going to create our perpetual calendar, and then our sequential. Ten years of Stephen's life, who is a mind-blowing genius. And um, I would never have met him if that issue hadn't happened. So karma is pretty great. I find that story so charming. And, you know, I love the fact that Stephen, uh, you know, worked with you directly on two of these watches, the perpetual calendar and the sequential, and kind of indirectly on the split escapement because the mm-hmm. split escapement came about from the perpetual calendar, you know. Um, but I think what was really nice when I discovered the story was your collaboration came about because you met him, but because you had a deep desire to kind of pay it forward. And tell me a little bit when you found out that he was having his own challenging time and how, you know, you kind of went to his aid. So 2007, he helps us. Um, 2011, I hear he's in trouble. He's actually quit his job as being a teacher of watchmaking. Let's not forget that Stephen has never gone to watchmaking school. He's an autodidact. He's taught himself. And he's actually now developing a movement for a brand. And that brand is in financial trouble, can't pay him anymore. So he's all alone. He's not getting paid anymore. And uh, so I go and see him. I was like, how can I help you? I mean, you can assemble our movements, but you're worth so much more than that. And um, he looks at me, he says, I have an idea for a perpetual calendar. Right. And now, no, no, we're not going to do a perpetual calendar. They just don't work. They're so sensitive. They jam, they jump when they shouldn't. And when that doesn't happen, the customers press the wrong push at the wrong time and, and, and break them. And he said, well, that's because the construction makes no sense. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, and then he explained, like in five, ten minutes, very quickly, like, why most of our perpetual calendars make no sense. I was okay, so what are we gonna do about it? He said, I've got an idea. The only idea he had at that moment was that instead of doing a month on 31 days and then subtracting or pushing on the six months where you don't want to go to 31, he said, let's create a movement which is on 28 days and then we will build 28, 29, 30, 31. I said, okay, but how do we build? Because the whole system of the grand levier of a perpetual calendar is a subtraction pro- uh, process. He says, I don't know, but we'll find. <laughs> and so we, 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 I said, look, I'll bankroll you for a year. And if it sort of makes sense, we'll continue. If not, we'll have to find another way. And, um, and then like, I'm gonna say two three, two, three months after he started, he came to me and he says, do you still want that flying balance wheel? Yeah, sure, a legacy machine needs a flying balance. He said, oh. I said, why? I can't put the escapement up there. So 
I said, okay, it's game over. He said, no. I said, what do you mean? Uh, we can't separate the escapement from the balance wheel. I said, why not? Again, we've always done that. And he just looks at it from outside like, why not? And that's how we had the idea of putting the escapement behind, the balance wheel in front, which has never been done. And we tested it when uh, we made all the parts, the prototypes that actually worked. And then we went that step forward. So um, I think we need more people in our industry who can challenge what's been done and who bring fresh ideas. And, and Stephen is an incredible asset to our industry. Well, you ha you're also a great champion to people like Stephen as well. So, I mean, I, I, it just makes me happy because uh, it's one thing to marvel at the, you know, expressiveness of your watches, the stunningness of the design, but to know there's like real human relationship there and, and it's about good people. It really, you know, that's, that's what makes MVNF really special to me, you know? It is. Um, you know, you're also really interesting to me, Max, because you make watches that are, I would say, on the cutting edge of avant-gardism, you know, through the horological machines, and also amazing neoclassical watchmaking with the legacy machines. And both of them are so singular in their expressiveness. Does your brain kind of like have a dividing line and this part's for this kind of watch and this part's for the other? Or how does that work, you know? I think I'm very schizophrenic, <laughs> definitely schizophrenic. It's two totally different ways of creating. Horological machines, I often say, are my psychotherapy. They're just like, wouldn't it be cool if? <laughs> sort of thing you, you get. Yes. <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if we did something which looks like a bulldog? And everybody's like, oh my God, he's at it again. And, um, and oh, the jaws could, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's absolutely decorrelated from any way a watch brand creates a product. Um, but it, it honors the great techniques of watchmaking, but that's not the point. Well, legacy machines is a real intellectual process of saying, without the great master watchmakers of the 18th and 19th century, we wouldn't be here. They invented virtually everything we're still producing today. And they invented. So what can we do to take that as a base and build upon it? And they would be proud of it. And that's how Legacy started, and, um, and luckily meeting people like Corey, like Stephen, and others, we actually were able to, to build upon that. So the, in, in the legacy machine, the function, the whole of watchmaking, the movement is incredibly important, and the case is a beautiful case. In, in horological machines is the whole concept, and then we have to find a way to make that concept into watchmaking. It's very different, very I, different. I love this story about your relationship with Kari and how when you first approached him, he was like, sure, I'll take a look at it, but I probably won't have time. And then talk to me from, about the journey from that to him being involved to him actually wanting one. You know? The first time I went to see him with the drawing of LM1, which I didn't show him initially, I just went to see him and said, look, Kari, you know me for my HMs. I've got a new idea, a new concept. Um, I would love you to work with me because it's going to be a tribute to the 19th century. And he said, well, thank you very much, but I've got just too much work. We're talking 2009, huh? and uh, I can't do anything for anybody else. So I, I took out the drawing, put it on the table, and where you, it, it really is the LM1 as you see it today, except the finishing of the, the design shape was different. And um, I said, look, this is the idea. <laughs> and then he took it. Uh, ballpoint, and he started, oh, you could do that, and the balance wheel, maybe you could do it that way, and the bridge behind, ah, if you're talking of 19th century, the bridges should be that way, etc. And so he's talking all by himself, <laughs> and, and after five minutes, he sort of looks up, and I'm like, Curry, does that mean you're going to do it? And he cracks up with this really big smile, and he says, uh, oh, that, that I want to do. And so we started that way, and then he, he worked, of course, on the movement, but he'd never seen the watch. So Basel Fair 2011, we had a very little booth. He had also a little booth next to the academy. So I called him the day before Basel, I mean, the official opening. I said, look, come, 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 I've got the watch. So I close the door of the, of the booth and I show him the LM1 and he puts it on his wrist and he cracks up with this enormous smile. Oh, it's beautiful, oh, it's so beautiful. And he looks at me and says, would you agree to swap? Oh, sorry? He says like, you take one of my pieces and I can have one of these. And for, for me, that's probably one of the 
one of the greatest moments of my life. That somebody you admire so much, who's got so much experience, so much talent, says, I want one of your pieces. It's wow. Like, and, and so we swapped. So I've got a 28 and he's got an LM1, which he wears all, very often. I've got customers who say, oh, I just had a meeting with Kari, he's wearing your watch. I'm like, no, it's also his watch. And, um, and so, yeah, and then we went on to do a LM2, LM101, and then he worked also on the Thunderdome. So we've, um, we've worked on four calibers together. I'm an incredibly faithful person. And um, one of the things which I, I, now I look back and I'm very proud of is people we love continue working with us. And if you think of this MBNF lab here in Singapore, I've been working with the Tay family for 24 years. They were one of the first five retailers who helped us 17 years ago. And there are two other labs which are opening in the next month, which is one with Conopas in Paris, and one with uh, West Time in Beverly Hills. And the other mad gallery is in Dubai with the Siddiquis. Those are four out of the five people who helped me at the beginning 17 years ago. So that, that means something. That really means something. I think Mike in particular is, is a guy I really admire because he has so much genuine passion for the culture of watchmaking. I mean, he privately has probably one of the greatest collections of watches and clocks and pocket watches in the world. But you know, tell me about how you first met him and what your journey has been like with him over the years, right? Because I think I remember I'm meeting you, I think, at Tempest, if I'm not mistaken, so back in 2004. The first time I met Mike was... Uh, 2000, oh no, 1998 or 99, early 99, I'm coming to meet his dad, Dr. Tay, Henry, uh, with, for Harry Winston. So I've just been appointed the head of Harry Winston, and I come with my little collection in my bag to see him and say, would you be interested to carry the line? And Mike was there at the meeting. And I think he just more or less come into the company he was at before Gerald Genta, Daniel wrote, and he just come back to Singapore. And, and Henry more or less told Mike, okay, we'll take the brand, you select the pieces. And that's how it started. Wow. And I was a youngster, he was even younger. <laughs> and, and we were two youngsters looking at the watches like, okay, we'll try that, try this, try that. And uh, that's the beginning of the story. And um, so, yeah. It's 24 years. Wow. Yeah, we're, we're old fogies now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> you know, to me, it's really interesting that the very thing that you kick-started so many years ago with Opus, um, the, the love for independent watchmaking, has never experienced a more momentous occasion. I mean, the whole world is in love with independent watchmaking. Max, tell me why you think that customers now understand what makes it so special. Oh, there are many reasons. Um, I'll tell you why I own so many independent creators' watches. Because when I wear my Kari, when I wear my Orvirk, when I wear my, uh, my, even my Sarpaneva, my Silberstein, I know what those people have gone through to create their brand. And it's never been easy. It's been incredibly difficult. Look at Alain. He went bankrupt. Uh, and... Uh, when I bought the Resence, uh, Alain Silberstein Resence, look at how Benoit had to battle the first eight to ten years of his life to have his brand. So you not only have incredible ideas, you've got, in the case of a curry or what we do, incredible hand finishing, hand angling, hand engraving, artisanship, which most don't do anymore. But you have a piece of a soul, you've got a piece of a story, of that creator on your, on your wrist. So you're not only a consumer, you're a patron. And that for me says it all. It's um, every piece is the story of a human being and I, I'm a little bit, a little bit a patron to their art to allow them to go to the next piece. That's lovely. I remember when you gave us the great honor of, of, of where, being our customer for the very first Alain Silverstein restaurants with Grail Watch. Um, 
Alan, Alan Silberstein and I were discussing this, and you know, the reason there are 36 watches on there is that he believes, well, in, in the Jewish tradition, he believes there's 36 individuals on earth who are these righteous individuals and they're benefiting all of mankind. And we both came to the conclusion that's perfect because Max is certainly one of those guys. We don't know who the other 35 are, but, but Max Buser is certainly one of them. And, and you continue to be. So uh, just a, a, from the perspective of the industry and watch lovers, thank you for everything that you thank do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure, brother.